live. We're not streaming on Twitter tonight. Sorry to say. Uh, still having a hard time as Twitter went away from Periscope. Figuring out how to, you can easily stream if you're going straight through Twitter. But if you go through a third-party streaming service like we do, it's, uh, so far it's been rocket science. No doubt, no joke. Like, I'm trying to figure it out still. But, looks like we're good. So, welcome in, everybody. It is the Huddle Up Podcast, presented, as always, by Mile High Huddle, powered by Blue Wire Pods. And I'm your host, Chad Jensen. With me, my fellow football priest and the deputy editor of MileHighHuddle.com, Zach Kelberman. Zach. How bizarre was it to see Von Miller stand up there today as he was introduced to L.A. media and to L.A. fans, really, and sporting the color, saying it feels right, and all the little talking points that you would expect him to say, but still, wasn't didn't it feel like you were kind of like living in upside-down world? I think the most bizarre thing was the fact that his number was literally peeling off the jersey he was wearing. I mean, did they put the number on there with duct tape? I don't really understand that. Uh, It's weird to see Vaughn in different colors. It's weird to see Vaughn talk about another team as his own now. But I mentioned this yesterday, and I'll say it again. When he said, I went to sleep 4-4 and and I woke up 7-1, and that's spoken like a man who finally escaped purgatory. And I don't think a person or professional could blame him for feeling that way. A lot of people are taking those comments to mean like he already forgot about the Broncos. He turned the page. He's not. He's divested now. Well, he's on to a new chapter in his life, and he's competing for a title right now, a chance he hasn't had in the last half decade. So again, you know, from the Broncos' perspective, it's 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 kind of sucky to move forward without 58 on the field, but now it's weird, and uh, I guess refreshing to see number 40. He got a blessing from the, I, I forget who it was who wore the number. He got the blessing from their family to wear it, and I hope he does well. Aaron Donald said he could not stop smiling since Vaughn was acquired, and he hasn't been this happy since his baby was born. Again, if you're a fan of Vaughn Miller, you have to be happy for his new surroundings. Yeah, it's just going to take some time. It's just going to take some time to get used to it and for it to fully sink in. I think Broncos fans have come to terms with the reality that Vaughn was traded, but I don't think it's going to really hit home till they see him suited up chasing quarterbacks in yellow and blue clay do clay do i did we come to a decision on this clay do right because clay does would have an h good evening gents and thank you for that super chat bro my question of the night is does it make me a bad fan to hope that the cowboys buzzsaw us bad enough to make george payton think dallas culture is the one he wants to create interesting notion zach your thoughts well, I mean, the bus off maybe would give George Payton some uh, eye-opening insight as to why he should hire Kellen Moore as the next head coach. There's rumors that he's targeting people like Dan Quinn and Jonathan Gannon and Jason Garrett, God forbid. Kellen Moore is the way to go, and among others like Brian Dayball and Greg Roman. I could definitely see the fans' point of view if the Broncos get blown out in this game like they very well could. It might force Peyton's hand not only to maybe consider firing Elway, Fangio, and Pat Shermer, but going in the right direction and plucking one from the Cowboys tree. You need a a franchise quarterback, but you have to have the coaching to go along with it. The Broncos have neither right now, unfortunately. Speaking of Fangio, um, his comment about Dak Prescott, not... (laughs) How did he last until the fourth round, which I think is kind of a sore spot for Broncos fans because he was a guy that um, I know a lot of the uh, MHH draft guys back in 2016 really liked him. And he dropped to the second, dropped to the third, dropped to the fourth. John Elway, he's like, no, we're we're good with Trevor and Paxton because he drafted Paxton in the first round that year. Right. Yeah. So just bizarre. And then the year before, he takes Brock Osweiler, you know, Brock Lobster over Russell Wilson. It wasn't a good two years for old John. But the tail end to that quote, like you just brought up, Fangio goes, somebody should take a dive into that. Like, he might as well have said, why didn't John Elway draft Dak Prescott? Why did he take Paxton Lynch? Kind of an interesting comment, but it's going to show the Broncos what they really need. Dak's playing at an MVP level, and and Kellen Moore, I think, is the future of head coaching in the NFL. It's not going to be pretty for the Broncos. In all fairness, though, to John Elway, every team in the league passed on him thrice, some four times, including the Cowboys passed on him three times. So for what it's worth, Uh, Sam Bam, good to see you, brother. Thank you for the super chat. He says, good evening, Broncos country. I'm off to Dallas tomorrow from southern New Mexico. 
Mavericks game Saturday night, Broncos game Sunday afternoon. Hope the Broncos can give them boys a good fight. BBM. What is the BBM, dude? I don't know. What what is this mysterious acronym? Blackberry Messenger. It's what it used to be back in the day before iPhones, but Blackberry Messenger. Probably not. Yeah, you used to be dope and cool and, you know, uh, bougie if you had a Blackberry back in the day. Or a Sidekick. That's one of my favorite phones. You ever have those with the full uh-uh. keyboard that slid out? Oh, yeah, yeah, awesome. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, my wife Very had cool. one of those. Um, guys, today it is Thursday evening, and it's that time of the week where we take a peek inside the Mile High Mailbag. We are your football priests, and we understand every night here is mailbag night, but we're here to offer you the absolution and answers to your burning Broncos questions nonetheless. We're still riding high off of the raffles from last night. That was really fun, making sure uh, everyone got who won, you know, organizing things. There's a few people, though, by the way, on Facebook uh, that I haven't heard from. I need your details to get you out a little care package, including Gary Leeds Palmer. Gary, if you're listening, I need your shipping address and your T-shirt size, my friend. Yvonne, what's good? Down in Mexico. Good to see you, brother. Thank you. Appreciate you. Um, Zach, the Denver Broncos, we haven't really dissected this quite yet, but going up against Kellen Moore, I thought it was interesting what Vic Fangio had to say. And this kind of touches on, uh, the comment about that he made about Dak, but he was actually asked about his impressions of Kellen Moore, a guy who could very well replace him as head coach in, in Denver. Here's what he said, quote, the Cowboys got a really good offense. It's balanced. I think that's the word everybody looks for in an offense. They run it very well. I think they're the top leading rushing team statistically in the league. He's had no reason in their games. He's had no reason to. Oh, he doesn't ever give up. Pardon me. I jumped a sentence. Uh, he's had no reason to in their games. They've got those skill players outside and the tight ends and the backs. Their backs do a great job in the running game. Dak He's a great quarterback. There's a story for you. How does that guy last until the fourth round? There you go. Somebody take a dive into that. Joe Montana lasted until the third round. Tom Brady to the sixth. It happens. They've got a really highly, highly talented offense, and Moore is doing a really good job of calling the plays, having wrinkles, and staying committed to what they do best. I think he's doing a great job. Close quote. Zach, I want your reaction to that, and then I also want an answer to you on this question. The, the uh, Cowboys, of course, hired Mike McCarthy. Is Kellen Moore running Mike's offense, calling plays from Mike's offense, or is this his offense? Well, first of all, asking Fangio talking about Kellen Moore is like a hobo talking about an astrophysicist, Chad. I mean, I, I don't really care what he has to say. He doesn't even watch the Broncos offense on the field <laughs> That just all. finally landed to me. I'm like, hobo, astro, oh, okay. It's just, you know, what his, and then he goes on some tangent where he thinks out loud about other quarterbacks that have been taken later in the draft. It's like, Vic, what are you talking about there? But in terms of Dallas, it's actually Mike McCarthy running Kellen Moore's playbook. Kellen Moore is the Pat Shermer of the Cowboys offense. The difference is Kellen Moore is actually talented and competent at his job. Uh, But it's fully his system. It's his play calling. Him and Dak kind of devise plays weekly depending on uh, game plans and opponents. They even kind of do audibles mid-game. They have a really good simpactico going on. So it's fully Kellen Moore's experience. And Mike McCarthy kind of uh, defaults to him on most calls. Whoops, whoops, I just clicked the wrong thing. Uh, Based Gase, thank you, brother. Micah Parsons versus Pat Sertan and Lamb versus, wait, Parsons versus Sertan and Lamb versus Judy. The two first-round picks the Broncos could have taken versus the Uh, two they did take. Yeah, I mean, I still, um, I'm totally happy with Patrick Sertan. I don't question that right now at all. And the Broncos have been, cursed health-wise at linebacker, but it could have ended up being a blessing in disguise, Zach, because you got Kenny Young, and if he can continue to kind of build on what he did, I mean, it's not like he was some absolute game wrecker against Washington, but as George Payton said yesterday, he's got juice, and you could see that. It was palpable. When he was on the field, there was one play in particular pretty early on in the game where running back was able to squeeze through a hole. It was very well blocked, but Kenny Young, he's taking on a guard, and he sees the dude coming up through the gap, the B gap, and he sheds that block and then straight up one-on-one, boom, engages him, takes him down. It was his one and only solo tackle on the night. He ended up with four tackles, one solo. But that was a very impressive play, and it's the type of thing that we saw 
from Alexander Johnson pretty regularly, but Kenny also has some speed and some other things. So I don't worry too much about the whole Parsons versus Sertan. Now, the Lamb versus Judy is a much more interesting question to me because C.D. Lamb was my favorite uh, wide receiver in the class, and he was there for the taking, and the Broncos ultimately took Judy. In Judy's defense, though, Zach, before I throw this back to you, he had some bad luck uh, this year with the injury bug. But conversely, C.D. Lamb had bad luck last year at the quarterback position, as did Judy in terms of, you know, neither one was inherited in the, as a rookie like a proficient, established veteran quarterback. They both had their ups and downs and obstacles to overcome, but if I could go back in time, I probably would have taken C.D. Lamb. I mean, you were right in hindsight. My favorite receiver was Henry Ruggs, so, you know, yikes about that. Uh, C.D. Lamb, he's benefited from better quarterback play, though. That's indisputable. You give Dak Prescott to Jerry Judy, and I think he'd be putting up numbers, too. Right now, I would say CD's the more polished receiver. He doesn't have as many drop issues as Jerry Judy. He's more of a game wrecker. He's more of a game breaker. I'm with you on Sertan. He's going to be a Pro Bowl, if not all pro caliber player, but so is Micah Parsons. And it's interesting that I believe it was George Payton who said if they didn't take uh, Pat Sertan at number nine, Micah Parsons would have been their pick there. So it was kind of neck and neck. The guy is an absolute monster off the edge. He can play defensive end. He can play linebacker, uh, off ball. He does it all. And against a Garrett Bowles-less offensive line, it could be a long, long afternoon for Teddy B. You know what's interesting is Malik Reed actually played some catch up. He's on pace right now to barely uh, match what he did last year in terms of sacks. I know it sounds like it's kind of a weird segue, but I'm reading this press release uh, packet from the Broncos that we're going to go over here in a minute. But re check this out: "Quote linebacker Malik Reed, who has four sacks this season after a two sack game in Week Eight versus Washington." ranked second among all undrafted players with 12 sacks since the start of the 2020 season. Zach, I would like to believe, and by the way, Christian, appreciate you, bro. He says, no CD, no Smith. Talking about uh, CD Lamb, no Tyron Smith. It doesn't matter. It's all coaching. More is greater than Vic. We feel you on that. We really do. Um, we'll see about CD. What's the word yeah, on CD? I was going to say, Christian, I, I wouldn't assume he's he, he's out. He, he was a DNP today. He has a little bit of an ankle, but... Right now, the expectation is he's going to play. So I wouldn't assume. Tyron Smith is definitely out, but CeeDee Lamb more than likely will play barring a setback. But I'm right there with you, obviously. It always comes down to coaching, and Kellen Moore versus Vic Fangio is so unfair. I'll take it one step further. Dan Quinn versus Vic Fangio is so unfair because he has his guys ready to play every single week, and he's getting more out of less in Dallas right now. That's the sad part. Appreciate you, Travis, the winner of the Pat Sertan jersey. You got that ordered today. Glad to take care of that business. He says, I love our Broncos, but I see Kellen Moore showing how good he can coach. Yes, indeed. Uh, Zach, before I lose my train of thought on this, though, I want to get back to this thing on Malik Reed that got stuck in my craw a moment ago. We saw a, him play with a different kind of energy last week, and I don't know if it's because simply Vaughn was out, and so he felt the onus to really step up. Or if the players could kind of sense something on the horizon and so they kind of played with a, um, I don't know, a, a more energized kind of intensity, what do you expect to see from Malik Reed? Because he did, let us not forget, finish 2020 as Denver's leading sacker with eight. He's halfway to that and we're still not, I mean, technically, because it's an odd number, you, there's never going to be truly a middle of the season, but we're about as mid-season as you can get right now. Well, let's let's also keep in context that Washington was down three starters on the OL. So that made the job easier for everyone involved. Malik Reed had a good game, but that contributed to it. Uh, I think he benefited from having front seven play from Shelby and Draymond getting pushed up the middle. That helped the linebackers out. I think Jonathan Cooper was something of uh, explosive bookend off the edge. And it just helped that he beat his man one-on-one. -on -one. The defense was a little up more for that game than previous games. Not, nothing overwhelming as far as I'm concerned. If the Broncos were smart, they would employ the same approach. The Cowboys are not going to have Tyron Smith. Uh, they're starting uh, Terrence Steele, who's playing right tackle right now, left tackle, former undrafted free agent. He's not exactly Tyron Smith, put it that way. He is beatable. So I would hammer that side and hopefully Malik Reed can beat his man one-on-one. -on -one. We'll see if it was just an outlier this coming week. The Duchess, and then I want to grab this YouTube comment from Harold Richard here. Michaela says, anyone wonder where we would be if we would have drafted Dak or even Deshaun Watson? Oh, to dream. 
the Duchess jumping in. Thank you so much. And by the way, we need to know what your jersey size is. So let us know. Scott can keep an eye out. Just say it in the chat because we do have your address, but what's your jersey size? I'm not sure on that. Um, where would we be? You know, with Deshaun Watson, I, I'd really rather not contemplate. But Dak, you know, that's something that I think Bears talking about because didn't Watson come in in 2017, right? I don't blame the Broncos at that stage for not taking Watson because they had just drafted Paxton Lynch and John Elway didn't feel like he had gotten a real uh, honest evaluation of Paxton because of the passive aggressive kind of power struggle that had ensued in Kubiak's last year with regard to Trevor Simeon. So I understand in, with the exception of the Arizona Cardinals a couple of years ago, I mean, teams don't draft a Q in the first round and then draft another one the next year. It's, I mean, it's, so rare it's not even saying exception to the rule like it just doesn't happen but once but still Dak to think about what he could have done in Denver you never know because sometimes in order for players to realize potential they got to land in the right spot and Dak did land in the right spot because Tony got hurt as a rookie he got hurt early in training camp and boom it became the Dak show from there for better or for worse and it turned out to be Zach for the better you know, I can answer the question. I, I think realistically, the Broncos would have been in the same spot as in real life where Dak and, and Deshaun ended up with subpar coaching. It wouldn't have mattered how talented they were if you saddled them with bad coaching. Jason Garrett was not a good coach to exploit Dak Prescott's uh, strengths. And the same goes for Bill O'Brien and, and Deshaun Watson. They're good enough to take you to the playoffs, but how many titles have Dak Prescott and Deshaun Watson won? I and mean, realistically, when you think about it, so the Broncos, and I'll continue holding firm to this. I agree with you, Chad. They had Paxton Lynch. Uh, they kind of got burned on Osweiler the year before that, and they had Trevor Simeon playing well. But their biggest blunder wasn't the coach, wasn't the quarterbacking. It was hiring the wrong coaches. You give Deshaun Watson to Kyle Shanahan, you're cooking with grease. You give Deshaun Watson to Vance Joseph, you're cooking with nothing. Um, it's funny you say that because you're the only other person I've ever heard say cooking with grease, except for really the people where I come from. Every time I've not every time, oftentimes when I've said that, people go, "You mean cooking with gas?" I'm like, "No, no, no, cooking with grease." I've I've heard so many variations. I've heard cooking with oil, cooking with gas, cooking with grease. Yeah, you can cook with I a mean, lot of things. Apparently, I mean, I understand the gas thing because you know when you, in the culinary business, pans heat up a lot faster on a flame. Uh, when it's gas, boom, instead of like an electric uh, element trying to heat up. But nevertheless, I digress. Harold, appreciate you being with us, my friend. He says, I like watching MHH on YouTube. But the one better thing about the uploads, like on Apple Pods or Spotify, is they have the ESPN voice homeboy that does intros and outros uh, to Sports Center doing intros for the MHH podcast. Yeah, we've got our uh, we've got our secrets, bro. But we appreciate you. However you enjoy the podcast, <laughs> we appreciate it. So, um, The God King. Mark, down in Georgia, jumping in. Generous super chat. Need your uh, jersey size. You also won a jersey last night. Hit us up, dude. He says, what's up, my guys? All I can say is go Braves. Yes, indeed. Congrats to the Atlanta Braves. Uh, hashtag Scott, great dude. Hashtag Huddle Up Pod. Hashtag Chad Gangsta. Hashtag Zach the Man. I'm under the weather, but thank you all for the jersey. Love you guys. MHH. Thank we you, love Mark. you too, bro. Hope you... Uh, you're feeling better yep. on the quick because that's no fun. I just beat a bug about two weeks ago that was pretty crappy. Thanks, Mark. As always, feel better, and we appreciate you. Uh, Clay Do again. Clay Do, we got an Clay-do. answer. Oh man, I suck at this. Clay Do. Oh, I'm reading it. <laughs> I can't take it anymore. It's Clay Do. Thank you, bro. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's a childhood nickname. Yes, it is misspelled, but shorter and more to the point. Also, you said you wanted my Twitter handle last stream. Was it? Yeah, dude, we definitely want to. All of our supporters and Super Chat superstars, we want to connect with you on Twitter. Keep the conversation going. Keep tabs on you. But we also like to be able to shout you out, tag you after each show when you contribute to that show. So, yeah, connect with us on Twitter. Clay Doe. Appreciate you, bro. <laughs> Thank you. Um. Okay. Zackler, what's good, Zackler? Connect on Twitter, buddy. Who's been the best Broncos O lineman the last ten years? Ryan Clady. I mean, he's been gone for five, but 
six now. This is the sixth year hmm. he's been gone. And technically he didn't play really in 2015, so you could argue longer. But I still don't think the Broncos – I still don't think there's been a player on the roster – better than Ryan Clady over that span. And Ryan was here for, you know, four of those 10 years. That's my, that's my answer. I think he deserves to be in the ring of fame. I'm glad he got a ring because he was on the roster technically when they won Super Bowl 50, even though he was injured the, the entire season. But um, he talk about depredations, you know, he went from the, he was drafted in the first round by Mike Shanahan, 2008. So he went through the uh, last year of the Cutler era then he went through the McDaniels depredations of 09 and 10. Then he went through the whirlwind of the first year of the Fox regime with Tebow and all that. Then he finally gets a quarterback in Peyton in 2012, multiple Pro Bowls. I mean, basically, if Ryan Clady played the season, he was an all-pro and a Pro Bowl. I think he is not only the best left tackle or best offensive lineman for this team within the last 10 years, but I think it, it's you got a real argument. Who was the best left tackle in team history? Ryan Clady? Gary Zimmerman, who's in the Hall of Fame. I'm going to go with Juwan James. <laughs> <laughs> honestly, Too though, soon. honestly, I think Clady's the right call here. They haven't really had a great stretch run of offensive line play in the last decade. Orlando Franklin comes to mind as well. I, I think he was fairly solid, Chad. I'm not, you know, as a not, right tackle, he was solid till the Super Bowl 48. Then he yeah, um, came undone. They but. all came undone in that game, though. True. Uh, Zane Beatles. Throw a, a random name out there. I, I'm just you got a Pro Bowl under Peyton, so shout out to Zane. I'm and just going. Peyton. I'm Peyton. I'm reaching way back uh, right now, but yeah, I, I'm going to go with Clady. I agree with you. I would throw as a close sec, not a close, but the number two would be Louis Vasquez, the right guard that was in Denver for four years, 12, 13, 14, 15, four years. Uh, Matthew Beatty, what's good, buddy? He says, when does Michael OJ Moody come back and keep up the good work? I listen to you guys all the time, more so on iHeartRadio because of work. Thank yeah, you. it's cool. It's cool to hear how people consume, enjoy the show. Um, you know, when we upload the podcast after these live streams, you know, we just put an intro and an outro, upload it. It goes to all the different podcast listening platforms. So uh, cool to hear that you're checking it out on iHeart, buddy. Thanks. In terms of Oja Moody, I think he's a little further away uh, from a saying Bassey who's returning to practice. They're both coming off uh, – injuries but it seems like oj is a little further away but he's going to make his debut at some point and hopefully he holds up better than uh kyle fuller did in that role um let me see so the broncos in case you missed it they got three corners coming back from pup and or injured reserve and that is a sang uh duke dawson and mike ford so i think oj yeah he's probably an after the buy um type thing the duchess again how about medium Prefer the man style, white or orange. Much love. I also got a bug. I feel you. Feel better, Michaela. That sucks. Um, you know, it's funny. She says the man style on the jersey. That's what Christy wanted, too. She wanted men's whatever the size was. I don't even remember. But um, they must. it just must fit better. I don't know. Probably. Cody Dub, what's good? Want I want Denver to win, but I want Kellen Moore to play his way into a head coach job with us. I think this could be the game for Kellen to show what he's got for Denver. Most definitely. I can promise you George Payton is going to be paying very close attention to, I mean, for obvious reasons, but additionally with Kellen Moore to see, you know, Hey, how could I envision this guy, you know, perhaps as a candidate for us, uh, if, if we need to hire a new head coach, I think Zach that, I mean, the, if you look at the rest of the schedule, Dallas, then you got Philly. Philly's the last like halfway merciful opponent on the schedule for the most part. Everyone else from then on out, dude, it's a murderer's row. I mean, Detroit, I guess. Throw for, I forgot about Detroit. I'm trying to think who else. Those are the only two that you could say Broncos have a 50-50 shot of winning. This Broncos team. So you could be looking at Zach four and – what's the math now? Four and 11? No, four and 13. Thank you. Four and 13. It's weird. It is weird. The thing about Kellen Moore, if, if George Payton wants him, regardless, he's going to have to throw some money after him, and he's going to have to get to the front of the line. Kellen Moore is a hot commodity right now. 
And uh, apparently his reps have reached out, chat to TCU about the head coach opening there. And the former head coach, Gary Patterson, was making $6 million per year. So he's going to really, if George Payton wants Kellen Moore, he's going to have to outbid other teams and other universities and programs or convince him and, and break out the full court press about why he should come to Denver. But I hope he does. I pray he does. We have a uh, baller uh, showing out on Facebook. Randy with some huge stars. Thank you, my brother. And as we go to to answer and address what's on Randy's mind here, just want to show everybody where we're at. We're only four days into the month of November. We're already 30% basically complete to our goal of 200,000 stars. When we reach 200,000 on Facebook this month, we're going to raffle off a Broncos jersey of the winner's choice. And uh, the only people in the running for that raffle are the people who contributed to the goal, like Randy, who currently finds himself atop the chart at number one, followed by Travis Weber, Shane Daniels, Matthew Beatty, Doug Raquel, Morgan Henry, Pete Middleton, Tim Hoffman, Yvonne, really starting to become a force to be reckoned with, and Michael Ronquillo. So shout out to you guys. Randy says, I hope Denver hires a young head coach with an offensive background. I'm not sure a young GM will do that. I'll be surprised if our GM doesn't hire a defensive head coach. He is from Minnesota. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, that is a good point. But as much as I like Mike Zimmer, and I'm a Zimmer fanboy, how what has it really done for the Vikings? You know, they've had a couple of playoff runs under him. They got to the playoffs with Teddy. Got to the playoffs with Kirk. Got to the playoffs with uh, Case. So they've been they've made a, you know, they're about an every other year playoff um, team under Zimmer. But I just don't think with that guy you're going to get over the hump. Mike Zimmer is the Jason Garrett of Minnesota. I mean, you can win and have a winning season with him, but he'll never take you over the hump. And just like Jason Garrett, you can make the case that he shouldn't be, but he's a better coordinator, Mike Zimmer, would be than a head coach. I really hope, I've seen that theory that Peyton's going to recruit Mike Zimmer and then go after Kirk Cousins and kind of complete the Minnesota trifecta. I don't see him going in that direction. We've also heard the names of, you know, Dan Quinn and Jason Garrett, Jonathan Gannon, all these retread some defensive-minded head coaches. I don't think Peyton's going to go that direction. I have been wrong before, though, about him. We didn't think he'd trade Von Miller, and he did that. I just pray, I really do, they they kind of uh, take stock of where the NFL's going, where the NFL's moving, and that's a younger, preferably offensive-minded guy to take the controls. Well said. Kayaka in the house. What's good, brother? Appreciate you, bro. He says, uh, Kai and I just watching... Uh, and showing some aloha to my guys. Love y'all. Hashtag Broncos country. Chad, Kai loves his Vaughn plushie and says thank you again. He was crushed when I gave him the Vaughn news. Yeah, dude, that's my my boy. I got I gave him the little doll, you know, baby Vaughn, we call him. And uh, he loves that thing. He's a he's a he's a child, so or he's a baby, five months. He doesn't even know what planet he's on, but he loves that baby Vaughn. Let me tell you something. I'm glad to hear. The Von Plushie is uh, doing what it's supposed to do. And yeah, bummer news. Thanks, Kayaka. You the man. I'm still waiting for that email, dog, by the way. Mike Reno, another uh, legendary supporter on Facebook, saying, whatever happened to Mike Boone? Is he not going to get activated this year? He is activated. He just hasn't <laughs> Pat gotten Pat Shermer happened. <laughs> yeah. He just hasn't gotten a touch yet. I mean, they can barely... Pat Shermer can barely figure out how to scheme five touches to Javante and eight to Melvin Gordon. And we're and so it's no surprise or it should come as no surprise that Mike Boone is still yet to get his. I'm pretty sure he's yet to get a carry as a Bronco. Let me double check that. That's crazy. The Philip Lindsay replacement, you know, and he can't even get a carry to the field. That's coaching. Coaching, um, coaching, coaching. I mean, I was looking at a list chat on Twitter, and it was a list of touches by running back through, you know, entering week nine now. 130 for this guy, 120 for that guy. I looked up the Broncos. It's like 80 and 70 for Melvin Gordon and Javante Williams. It's really sad what Pat Shermer's doing to this offense. So check this out. He has one touch. Mike Boone caught a three-yard pass against the Raiders. He <laughs> Not even six, a running play. He, he played six snaps that game, then didn't play any in week seven. In week eight, he played one single solitary offensive snap on special teams, though. You know, is where he's making his impact for now. But, uh, yeah, I mean, money well spent, I guess, right? 
Raise your hand if you would rather have Philip Lindsay back. I would. Doug Raquel, appreciate you, brother. He says, hi, Priest and Mile High Huddle. Family, such a blessing for this pod. A fan since 72. It will get better. Yeah, dude. Best predictor of a future is the past. And the Broncos, when they have gone through low periods, they always bounce back. Uh, unfortunately, most of those bounce backs following the low periods involved John Elway on some level. And uh, so what comes after this down period that, you know, is basically a result of Elway at the helm, only the football gods can tell. Yeah, you know, it's it's unfortunate because everyone thought the tides were turning this year and we have to wait until 2022, it looks like. But the good thing is, in this day and age, if you hire the right coaches and get the good uh, personnel in the building to match those coaches, you can turn it around in one season. So this time next year, we can be, be talking about a Broncos team that is maybe six and two, you know, not not four and four. It, it just depends on the coaching, but they can all turn around in one year just because they might enter a rebuild or whatever word you want to use. It not, does not mean it has to be three years. It can happen in the same year. So keep your head up for sure. By the way, Randy, we don't see on through our end. Scott has to tell us um, what the stars look like because unlike YouTube, uh, with Facebook on StreamYard, they haven't figured out how to display for us in the in the production room what the stars are. 15,000 stars from Randy. I mean, that wow. is a baller support wow. uh, for us. So thank you, bro. Thank you, we love you up there in the great wide north. Stay warm, dog. Stay warm. Um, okay, let me see. We're at uh, 31 minutes. We're doing pretty good. I still want to be able to go through some head-to-heads here. Uh, but let me just peruse. Yeah. We want to try and get to... Uh, Do we really? We must. This is something that must be done. Um, Marie says, didn't Dak miss a plane inbound to Denver to speak with Elway and that pissed him off? Yeah, I'm trying to remember the exact um, the exact story on that. But yeah, he somehow missed his opportunity to meet or work out for the Broncos. It was a pre-draft visit, wasn't it? Yeah, but it was an extenuating circumstance. Like it wasn't just some young guy, you know, being irresponsible. I'm trying to remember what that detail was off the top of my head that kept him from the plane. But either way, yeah, that good memory on you, Maurice. Miss planes, fax machines. The, Bron- the Broncos take L's from the most unlikely sources, don't they? <laughs> Andrew Baker, what's good? But you know what? Here's the thing. If you don't, if that fax machine doesn't go on the fritz, does DeMarcus Ware end up here in 2014? And do they then go on and still win the world title? Because you needed that to get Vaughn back. Remember, Vaughn, his career was teetering, dude. 2013. He's rocked with a six-game suspension for uh, trying to deceive the NFL drug testing policy by basically providing fake piss and because he knew he was dirty. Six games, they hit him hard, man. Then he tore his ACL. He was mingling with the wrong people, you know? Uh, It's like the whole idea of you sleep with the dogs, you get fleas, like my dad used to tell me. Choose your friends wisely. They say that you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with, for whatever that's worth. And Vaughn's average wasn't good. And Elvis, even though he looked up to Elvis and there was like a big bro component there, Zach, Elvis, I don't think, was the type of charismatic, take charge, let me tell you what's up, son, leader that Vaughn needed. And and Demarcus Ware, who he had looked up to and idolized as a kid growing up as a Cowboys fan, that alone was enough to get Vaughn's attention. And then the actual personality and leadership dynamic Demarcus Ware had that was the game changer. And uh, 2014, I want to say he did, it was like 14 and a half sacks, if I'm not mistaken. 2015, what's crazy is Vaughn didn't go off in terms of sacks in 2015 in the regular season. He had like 12 and a half or something like that. But that playoff run, golly, he and Ware together, man, they just hit the freaking zone right at the, at the perfect time together and the rest is history. But again, if that fax machine doesn't step in, Zach, and alter – the destiny of Elvis Doomerville, maybe the destiny of the Broncos in 2015 would have ultimately been altered. Ever the optimist. I love it. Andrew Baker. What's good, buddy? He says, do we maybe keep Teddy Bridgewater if the quarterback we want isn't there and fix these uh, defensive and offensive lines? Yeah, that's a distinct possibility, guys, that, that fans need to be prepared for as a possibility, as a 
eventuality, not a guarantee. In fact, I don't even really, I wouldn't even say to expect it, but just prepare yourself because if indeed this quarterback class turns out to be as thin, um, you know, as all the draft Knicks are saying, and nothing changes on that front, and the Broncos, even as he's stockpiling these premium round picks, Zach, it's just there's nothing there worth ponying up those picks to move up and get a guy. He's going to figure out how to get by for one more year, and who better to do that with than Teddy? But here's the thing on that, Zach. If that's the if that's what ultimately ends up happening, the unfortunate part for the Broncos is their scouts are going to have to figure out that draft class quick as they possibly can because you got free agency before you've got the draft. So if you want to keep Teddy around, you're going to have to make that decision and get it done well before you have a sure kind of understanding of your draft position and, and exactly where guys are going to fall. I mean, you said who better than Teddy. I can name a lot of players better than Teddy. People like Mike White out here beating the Bengals on a given Sunday. So if they want to go with the retread, you know, fail safe route, a holdover, a number two mentor, whatever label you want to use, could be Teddy for sure. But it's not going to matter. And we've been saying this for so long now, Chad. It's not going to matter who's quarterbacking the Broncos. If they don't fix right tackle, they don't fix the interior, they don't stack the cupboards behind the starters they have, they have to devote premium resources. That's draft picks and contracts, money, free agent cap dollars to fixing the line, regardless of whether they bring back Teddy or not. You have some pieces, but they are disparate. And despite having one of the top three position coaches on the defensive line and on the offensive line, the offensive line in particular is underperforming. They, they played better as a unit against Washington. The defensive line is starting to come along for whatever it's worth. Like Shelby starting to flash Draymond, you know, he's been able to get steady pressure. He just still hasn't really had that much luck getting home. Uh, you got to figure out nose tackle. Cause Mike Purcell ain't it dude can't stay healthy. And even when he's been on the field this year, he has not been good for what it's worth. So you do need to find yourself a big young nose tackle and I like Deshaun Williams Zach but I don't think he's a guy that you build around he's a great right. depth rotational guy uh Travis Tarbox what's up buddy no worries on the stars my friend he says he's busy at work but sending some love and listening no problem bro appreciate you being with us uh shall we uh grab this from Travis and then take a quick look at this head-to-head matchup Broncos Cowboys Travis says the writing is on the wall that even with the talent we have the coaches Fangio, Shermer, don't know how to coach and can't coach if their lives depended on it. I hope Peyton and whoever is the one in the owner position sees this. Yeah, that's the thing that people got it twisted. Like George Peyton, Zach, I understand why when the lights were on and he was standing in front of a microphone that he uh, enforced, I should say reinforced his support and faith in Vic because until you're going to fire the guy, that's what you do. You know, when you're when you're publicly facing and your head coach, as long as he's still collecting a paycheck from you, I mean, it's amateur hour, Bush League to say, you know, yeah, Vic's on a short leash, guys. I might fire him tomorrow. I don't know. Next question. You know, he's not that's not going to happen. Right. Uh, but I still thought it was a little ill advised to go so far jumping the shark on, I took this job because of Vic and doubling down like that, like, because it's so transparently not true. Not just the fact that he, we know he didn't take the job because of Vic, but because we know he doesn't really feel that way about Vic. How could you? I mean, we're not in the locker room every day. We're not in those position meetings, team meetings, GM meetings, Zach, but we have eyes and we can see what's happening on the field. In what world could George Payton truly be thinking that Vic's doing a great job, you know, onwards and upwards. It's it's all GM speak. And I think most fans are seasoned enough to know that. And the others are casuals who are taking Peyton's word as gospel right now. So I think it's, it's somewhat truthful what he's saying there in terms of the Broncos being in the thick of things. And it's somewhat deceiving for him saying that he took the job because of Fangio or that he has faith in him. That's always the, the dreaded vote of confidence. They're one step away from doing that. And that always signals the beginning of the end. And I'm telling you, don't believe into what Peyton is saying in early November. Watch what he does in early January, and I promise you it'll be much different. Uh, Michael got his Justin Simmons jersey. Awesome, dude. Send us a, uh, a selfie. We want to see uh, 
rocking that. We'll shout you out on on uh, MHH social. Let's take a quick look here, Zach. That's some head to heads and quick reminder: green signifies top ten, red signifies bottom ten, and the black are the teams in the middle. All right, your Denver Broncos sit at four and four, while the Cowboys have been defeated, but once. The turnover margin, the Broncos, after starting off well into plus territory, are now minus two. The Cowboys, meanwhile, are a healthy plus five, which ranks them sixth in the league. The Broncos are 20th in turnover differential. Uh, Time of possession, the Broncos, Zach, still are managing to hold on to the ball, which is crazy. You know, there's enough of a sample size here now, Zach, to be able to draw some conclusions. One of those conclusions is, The Broncos have been able to sustain some drives and stay on the field, but they're not converting them into points. And so that's the biggest thing that – not the biggest, but it's one of the biggest things that this offense led by Pat Shermer needs to fix and fix fast. And I don't think it's going to happen against a Cowboys team playing at home this week in a a friendly environment – with a defense right now kind of exceeding expectations, flying around the field, the complete antithesis of anything you see out of the Broncos defense, they're constantly up for every game. And to answer Matthew's question here, would you say the secondary is better? From a talent perspective, the Broncos have more talent. They're a better defense on paper, but right now Dan Quinn is getting more out of Dallas's players than Vic Fangio is out of the Broncos players. So that's where coaching comes in. It's really not going to matter what the Broncos do because unless they totally grow a brain between now and Sunday afternoon, Chad, I mean, they're going to get killed, That honestly, off the edge. Look at this. All the green Cowboys, net, net yards per game, first, yards per play, second, points per game, third, averaging 32 points a game, you guys. 32 points a game, like that is gnarly. Net yards rushing per game, they're number two. Net yards passing per game. They're number three. The fewest interceptions, the tenth fewest interceptions. Uh, they have lost four fumbles, which puts them middle of the pack. They have given it away a total of nine times, which puts them just outside the top ten and fewest. And they've only allowed 12 sacks through eight games, which is tied for the sixth fewest. They are the fourth best third down offense, converting 47.2% of their third down tries. Fourth. Red zone, though, they're struggling, which is – Interesting. I wonder why that is. Let's take a look at your Denver Broncos, though. Net can yards we, per game. It's not on the screen. Can we put it on the screen? You're not seeing it? Uh, I'm not. No. There we go. That's weird. I had Okay, apologies for that, guys. So here, look at this. Um, here, here's, the, here's the illustration, okay? Look at all the green here for your, for your Dallas Cowboys. Or not your Dallas Cowboys, but D- Dallas Cowboys, but for the Dallas Cowboys. Look at this. Meanwhile, the Broncos... 21st in net yards per game compared to Dallas being the first. Yards per play, Broncos are 21st, Cowboys second. Points per game, 23rd, averaging just 19. So right there, Zach, it's, I mean, if you're picking this game, you know, (laughs) you could probably two-score blowout, if not more. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, Broncos are 20th in rushing, 17th in passing, tied for 16th in interceptions, the fewest uh, 16th fewest interceptions with six, 17th fewest fumbles with four, uh, 15th fewest giveaways with 10. And then you get to sacks allowed. Oof, look at the difference here. Cowboys 12, as I mentioned, Broncos have allowed 25, which is there's only two teams worse than Denver and giving up sacks on the quarterback. Third down percentage, there's only four teams worse than the Broncos. Red zone, only five teams. So Zach, It's shaping up unless the defense without Von Miller, and we'll go through this, but unless the uh, defense plays truly inspired ball, look at that. uh, It's it's going to be tough tough sledding. Look at that though. I mean, all the Broncos rankings in the lower twenties and the and the and the mid teens, and you have the Cowboys third, second, third, first, sixth. It's really an interesting contrast. And, and what one team is trending toward, another team is trending toward when it comes to watching the Broncos offense versus the Cowboys offense. It's 2D versus 4D, honestly. Let's look at these defenses, though, because we keep hearing about how good the Cowboys defense is. Well, statistically, they're not as good, but they are in a few key areas. We'll get to that. First off, the Broncos are the sixth ranked defense when it comes to yards per game. They're giving up 
325.8, which is good. All right, they're a top 10 yards per game defense. Meanwhile, Cowboys are ranked 19th, giving up 366 yards per play. The Broncos are just outside the top 10, whereas the Cowboys are 27th. Points per game, the Broncos are allowing only 17.1, which is there's only one team in the league that's allowing less points per game to opponents than the Broncos. Cowboys are middle of the pack at 16th, average uh, relinquishing 23 points per game. Net rushing, the Broncos are allowing just 101 yards per game to opponents, ninth. But the Cowboys, this is their calling card it looks like here, all right? They are the sixth best rushing defense with just 88.3 yards per game that they're allowing. Now, one of the reasons, Zach, I want to pick your brain on this real quick. My theory on this is one of the reasons their rushing defense is so highly ranked is because the offense has been so exactly. prolific, teams have to abandon the run quite quickly in game plans. Exactly. It's all about game flow, game script. Those are terms that you're hearing more and more often lately, the buzzwords, but it's true. When you're facing the Cowboys offense and you find yourself down 14, 17 points in the blink of an eye, you're not going to stick to running the ball. You're going to start passing. That's why you see the big differential there, 6 to 28 when it comes to rushing versus passing. So, Net passing, the Broncos are still in the top 10 as a defense, barely. Uh, the Cowboys, though, because teams are throwing so much at them and trying to catch up, are uh, 28th passing defense. Interceptions, the Broncos only have six, while the Cowboys have 11. Fumble recoveries, the Broncos only have two. Cowboys have three. Takeaways, the Broncos have eight. But this is a number, Zach, that has my attention. Cowboys have 14 takeaways, which ties them for the third most in the league. When you think about it, Trevon Diggs alone has as many picks as the Broncos' defense, six. I mean, they're just better at getting the ball out. They're better at flying to the ball and making plays. One thing about a Fangio defense, Chad, in three years now, three seasons, how often have they come up with a a big takeaway, a big turnover? If it's not Simmons picking off a pass or Shelby Harris forcing a sack fumble or Vaughn, it's been nothing. Dude, honestly, last week's game against Washington was the first game I can remember since Fangio's first year where the defense actually made the type of plays that will win you the game in the clutch. Malik Reed's sack, his strip sack, the interception on fourth down. like Those are the type of plays that you need from a truly uh, proficient defense when the chips are down. You got it last week. If you can continue to play like that in the key situations, your team's going to have a chance. Now let's look at sacks. 20, uh, pardon, Broncos have 20, tied for seventh. The Cowboys, Zach, we hear about these edge rushers, but they only have 12 sacks. Tell us, tell, tell fans, Broncos fans, who might not be as educated on the Cowboys personnel, what to expect as far as their edge and their pass rush. Well, they've been without Demarcus Lawrence for the last five or so weeks. He's been on IR. He is their best defensive pass rusher. Uh, before Randy Gregory came to be, he's this team sack leader right now. I believe he still has four and a half sacks. He might have five and a half. They also are getting production, obviously, from Micah Parsons, but because Parsons is playing so many roles, they've dealt with injuries and this and that. He's also covering a lot more people. He's uh, being used in different roles. So the sack totals could be a little bit of an illusion. They're getting a lot of pressure. They have a couple rookies. They have a guy named Osa, whose last name I refuse to butcher live on air. It's not a Cowboys podcast. They also have Chauncey Golston. Uh, they really do have a, a couple players in the front seven that can get after the quarterback, but none more threatening than Micah Parsons and Randy Gregory. It's going to be a long afternoon if Calvin Anderson and Bobby Massey don't hold up, of all people. Third down, Broncos are bad. Only five teams are worse than the Broncos defense on third down. Meanwhile, Cowboys, that's their calling card. Their calling card is actually their third down defense. That's allowing them to get off the field and get the ball back to their quarterback in that offense. Second best third down defense. Red zone percentage, though, the Broncos, one of the reasons why they've been able to kind of, as George Payton would say, stay in the thick of it, hanging on for dear life, is they have maintained, for the most part, good red zone defense allowing touchdowns on only 50% of trips. Cowboys, though, not so much. Um, We could go through special teams. I don't really want to. We're getting along in the the stream anyway. But uh, that's your head-to-head comparison, Zach. And obviously off the cuff, just going off stats, it's looking like, again, this type of an opponent, as explosive as they are on offense, 
and as kind of dangerous as they can be in certain situations on defense, if you don't mind your P's and Q's, if you don't come out like you want to be there, if you don't come out and out physical and bring a higher level of intensity, even if you're not as good, you're going to not only get blown off the ball, it will be a buzzsaw. The only hope, and I, I wrote this as a little preview for the uh, the Mile High Roundtable article coming out, previewing the game. The, the only hope the Broncos really have, if, if you break this down, the game down on paper, is a trap game, a letdown game for the Cowboys, where they're welcoming in an opponent to their house, an opponent that's not as good. They're coming off the big emotional victory without Dak last week. Dak's coming back. So barring an injury of some sort or a letdown game, how could you have any confidence, Chad, picking the Broncos, a team that barely eats past the Washington football team, a bad team, in a game they had to have? It's, it's going to be tough. Uh, Matt Beatty says, other than Diggs, would you say the secondary is better, the Broncos secondary is better than the Cowboys? Zach, your answer. On paper, the Broncos are, but again, Dan Quinn is getting more out of the Cowboys' defense right now. I mean, they have names like J. Ron Curse and DeMonte KZ and uh, and Anthony Brown, Jordan Lewis. That's not names like Patrick Sertan and Kyle Fuller, Justin Simmons, Kareem Jackson. The Broncos have the name power. They don't have the staying power. It's all about coaching, and right now uh, they're getting decent production from a, a unit that's half as talented on paper than the Cowboy and the Broncos are. Um, guys, we have to rapid fire any remaining questions or supers that uh, are in the chat. Uh, okay, four. All right, uh, because I got things to do. I'm hopping on an airplane tomorrow, and I'm flying down to San Diego for a concert, and. Uh, I got some fish to fry, so I got to keep it tight tonight. Travis Tarbox, what's good? Since we signed, aka acquired, Kenny Young via trade, do you guys think we will re-sign either Josie Jewell or Alexander Johnson? Zach, that's an interesting question. The the presence of Kenny Young kind of alters the equation a little bit, but I still hold fast to the notion that I think the Broncos will approach both players and make a strong push to re-sign one of them. And if I had to bet my money on it, I'd bet Alexander Johnson. They both are playing pretty well to their credit, and I was never a big Josie Jewell fan, but I Alexander Johnson graded out by PFF as the number three inside linebacker in the NFL before he went down at the time of his injury. So I, I would wager, even if Vic Fangio won't return, and they've, they've blossomed, I guess, in a Fangio system, they're going to bring back one of those guys, and because they're coming off injuries, they're going to come back uh, on a short-term, team-friendly contract more than likely, but Kenny Young can play his way into the mix as well. He's also in a contract year. He's playing for a free agent deal, and I think the best linebackers will get paid by the Broncos. Doug, you're a prince. Thank you for the stars, my friend. Really means a lot. You know that. Um, Okay, let me see what else we got here. Michael, appreciate you, bro, as always. Love your optimism. Love uh, how much you care about the community, your fellow community. Appreciate you, brother. Send us that profile pic with or the uh, selfie pic with the the Simmons jersey. Mike Reno says, I don't see Teddy or Drew Locke here next season. With a new coaching staff, which I'm sure will happen, the quarterback position will change via free agency or the draft. Probably. You know, coaches, especially if it's an offensive guy, tend to want their own guys, you know, their handpicked guy. And even Vic Fangio, who's a defensive guy, the irony of this whole, like, Fangio v. Locke dynamic is that Drew Locke was the Vic Fangio inaugural pick, right? He was the quarterback drafted in Fangio's first year on the job. And of course, Fangio's first choice was Flacco. Joe Flacco was acquired via trade. Fangio was very much a proponent of that, even though, you know, the deal was, was done by John Elway and whatnot. Fangio was all about that. So, what, a, what that tells you about Vic, I think we already know the answer there. But nevertheless, Zach, whoever that coach is that comes in after Vic, whether it's a defensive guy or an offensive guy, the odds tell us they're going to want to go out and get their own quarterback that they can imprint on. And that's why, like we told you, when they made the move from Teddy to Drew, knowing you could have always gone to Teddy at any given point, it was signaling we gave it a, 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 as long as we want to give it with Drew as the potential future franchise guy. 
I, I couldn't imagine hiring someone like Helen Moore or Brian Dayball and then saddling him with someone like Teddy Bridgewater at quarterback. I, I mean, they have to go... It, it, it can't be a half measure if they want to enter this retooling period, rebuilding period, rebooting period, whatever you want to call it. If you hire a new head coach and that coach is of the offensive background, you let him pick his quarterback, either in free agency or the draft more than likely. That's the route they're going to go. That's the route they should go anyways through the draft and, and doing it the long-term way, the right way. Todd Ostendorf wants to know, why did we not trade Kyle Fuller? My guess? There's two reasons. Probably no takers. I mean, people probably would have signed. There are teams out there that would have given it a shot with Fuller, but even giving up a seventh-round pick, you know, probably just was too rich for their blood. He's expensive, and he's not good. And you can't be a combination of both and get traded. It's one or the other. I mean, he's going to be a, a free agent after the year, and it takes two to tango in the NFL, like you said, Chad. I don't think there was interest for him out there. All right, guys. Got to go. Sorry, it's a little bit early tonight, but uh, love and appreciate each and every one of you. We're off tomorrow night, of course. Uh, we'll be back Sunday for the gut reaction. and But don't forget to check out Dove Valley Deep Divers tomorrow night. Don't forget to check out uh, Mile High Insiders on Saturday night. And then Zach and I will be back Sunday, Kelberman's Corner, plus, of course, you know, the gut reaction. And with that, Zach, do your thing, my friend. Kelberman's Corner, again, though, will be at halftime of the Cowboys game, which starts at 11 11- uh, Mountain, one Eastern. So until we see you guys on Sunday, be sure to follow the pod on Twitter at Huddle Up Pod. You can follow the main account at Mile High Huddle. You can follow Chad on Twitter at Chad and Jensen. You can follow myself at Kelberman NFL. Go to huddleuppod.com and get yourself a football preset. Get yourself a Mile High Huddle hoodie. Get yourself a coffee cup. Anything and anything, anything and everything you can fathom is in that store. Also, facebook.com slash Mile High Huddle. Hit that big blue button for the aforementioned Kelberman's Corner, Broncos Book Club, and Trickle Zone each and every week. Five bucks a month at your fingertips. VIP content all day, every day. We appreciate the patrons there. Also, facebook.com slash Mile High Huddle Pod. Like that page and follow that page. And if you haven't already, go to Apple Podcasts and leave your football priest a five-star review for a chance to win. I had a shirt, a jer- or jersey, jersey, a... Uh, <laughs> oh, hoodie. Wait. Zach, um, I almost forgot. Let me pull this up. Uh, we do have a winner to announce for the drawing for October, the five stars. Uh, give me one second. F- finish, uh, finish the rundown just so that you know it's coming. I'm going to pull up uh, where I had that name. But as always, we ask you to do these three things. If you could subscribe, like, and share this video and every video you see on the MHH channel helps us grow and reach more Broncos fans just like you. Okay, let me try and pull up if Apple will cooperate. Uh, Pull up this person's name. Bear with me one second here. I want to be able to show their actual review. Well, I'll just do it this way. Appreciate you, Tim. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, buddy. Uh, Here we go. This is the uh, drawing winner. You got a little swag coming your way. Uh right here jb cats 1979 on apple pods tendered a five-star review on october 19th send best broncos content around love it great pod very in-depth analysis of the broncos randomly selected amongst your fellow five-star reviewers in the month of october so jb cats 1979 good good year by the way send us out uh, an email, milehighhuddle at gmail, with your personal details, your shipping address, and your T-shirt size, and we'll get you out a little uh, care package, buddy. So thanks. Appreciate you. Appreciate appreciate all of you, Chad. Have a great trip. Have a great weekend. I'll see you in the saddle on Sunday for the Gut Reaction Pod. Have a great weekend, guys. Take care, and as always, go Broncos. <laughs>